Hi, I'm Dane Stevens. Thanks for being here in Extraordinary Life. We are here with Dr. David Bricelli today. And Dr. David Bricelli is an international expert in the areas of trauma intervention and conflict resolution. And he's also the developer of the TRE, Trauma Release Exercises. Um, he has spent two decades living in and working in nine countries, providing trauma relief workshops and designing recovery programs around the world. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bricelli, for being here with us and sharing your uh, knowledge and expertise and inner story. Uh, it's great to meet you. Thanks for being thank here. Thank you, Dane, for the invitation. It's nice to be here. So I, I just did a small interview, or uh, sorry, a small intro, intro, and I could have gone on for a very long time. Uh, I see you've done a lot. Uh, you studied for everything from social work to psychology theology, bioenergetics, neurofeedback. You're certified in psychoneurology, uh, traumatology, and massage therapy. So that just leads me to the, the question, I mean, how did you put all this together? That sounds like an incredible journey. So could you just share with us uh, how you came to, and we'll talk about TRE in a bit, but how you came up to it. Yeah, well, it, it is an incredible journey in one way, and the other way, it just makes common sense, kind of, that I think many people go through this process through different ways, but anytime somebody's trying to recover from trauma or stressful experiences of life, what do we do? We feel aches and pains in our body, so we might go to a massage therapist. Um, we go to a counselor because we don't understand how to think things through. Um, when neurofeedback came onto the scene, we realized that not all of it's psychological, a lot of it is neurological. And almost inevitable, people's belief systems will be fractured or broken as a result of trauma. And so I needed to understand how, how do they think about their God or their higher power or whatever, and how is that fractured or sometimes actually thrown away? So now you've got both, you've got all of it, the body, the mind, and the spirit right. of the individual. And I believe that all traumatized people eventually touch each one of those. Their way into their trauma healing process may be different. They may start with the body. Someone else will say, I don't want to deal with the body. I just want to talk about it. Others will say, I've talked about it too much. I only want to do body work. Some will say, I became a Buddhist instead of a Christian. So they, we all are human organisms trying to evolve. That's my bottom line. And all of those dimensions belong to every one of us because even atheists and agnostics have belief systems. And so all of that gets challenged when life becomes challenging. And I just went through my own processes of trying to heal and I stepped on each of those little stones which led me to the next one and the next one. And for people who don't know what TRE is, it's a series of exercises that basically stresses the, the psoas muscle and creates a shaking, a tremoring of the body, and it just naturally releases energy from your nervous system, from your body. And I, I've just found that to be fascinating. Uh, I believe our healing is, is, everything is speeding up in the world, including our healing. And this is just such evidence of that, that we can really release uh, energy from our body I guess without going back and having to re-experience the, the event, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you think of the, I always try to think of the body as a living, pulsating organism. Take away the psychology and consciousness. The body simply pulsates to survive life, basically. But if something is stressful or threatening to it, the organism will squeeze naturally. And this happens to us all the time. Well, and that happens unconsciously. So if you get startled, you'll startle like this. Well, you don't think how to do that. And yet the neural pathways know physiologically exactly what muscles to squeeze, how tight to squeeze them, and how long to hold them. So we actually squeeze automatically during any stressful event at all, even if it's just the diaphragm and our breathing gets shallow. If you take that same principle, if the body knows how to squeeze itself when it feels there's a threat, then the organism must already be designed with a mechanism to undo the squeeze. Mm -hmm. And that's what TRE is. Mm -hmm. It's activating 
a neurological tremor mechanism that follows the exact pathway that the physiology used for self-protection. So, but I can't activate it through telling you about it consciously or talking to you because your ego would inhibit it. That's where we get stuck. Yeah. But because it's such a neurophysiological um, natural component of us, we can easily access it through exercises, which most people don't know. It's actually quite simple. And then the only thing that happens is the body begins to tremor or shake. Often the same thing that happened during the traumatic event, a person tremors or shakes, but we're going to activate it in a safe environment and simply give the body the chance to finally complete the process it was trying to do. Because right. if you were in a traumatic event and you found your hand shaking or your voice quivering or maybe your jaw or your knees, that's the healthiest thing that could have happened. Your body had elevated its nervous system and through the shaking, <clears throat> it was trying to downregulate itself. But then we squeeze the shaking because we don't like it. It feels like it's out of control. And we inhibit the very mechanism that's going to bring us back to health. So... This has always been with us. Have yes. we just suppressed it but through society over time? Did we let it happen at one time and we've just suppressed ourselves more? What yeah, happened? it's kind of interesting how it happened because I reviewed the history of all of this. If you think of it, first of all, the shaking mechanism is as natural and genetically encoded in us as the shivering mechanism. When your body's temperature drops to a certain level, it shivers automatically. You don't tell it to do that. You have no control over it. And when it warms itself back up, the shivering stops. Well, the same thing with uh, the tension mechanism, only it op operates as the opposite direction. When the tension gets high enough, the body begins to shake as a way of reducing that tension. Okay? So it's the same as the shivering mechanism. Right. One is for cold, one is for a high adrenal response, basically. Right. Right. So here's what happened. Same thing as crying. At the age of two, we begin to learn that crying, particularly for little boys, but even little girls, is not good. It's a sign of weakness. It's a sign of failure. Um, you should be ashamed of it. And so we actually learn how to inhibit the crying mechanism which means squeezing the diaphragm, chest cavity, and throat. But you can see people when it starts to overwhelm them as adults. Their jaw will quiver. <laughs> they'll, they'll try to hold it back in. So we actually trained ourselves out of one of the most natural mechanisms in the human organism to downregulate stress, and that's crying. Because we, we gave uh, adjectives to it that were... Um, uh, adjectives that we that are demeaning to us as humans you're weak you're fragile you're vulnerable um, you're you're not strong all those things so that's what we did with crying well this tremor mechanism is the same thing the minute somebody starts to shake they hold on to it because it's out of control people will know I'm weak they'll know I'm vulnerable they know I can be used I don't look strong I want to give a, a strong appearance and so again, we attributed negative qualities to an actually genetically encoded natural mechanism in the human organism. Mm -hmm. So that's where we dismissed it. But what's real interesting about it is the place that you can still find it quite prevalent, mostly in most uh, cultures that are more natural than the Western world that's gone into its head, but you will find it always in religious or spiritual traditions. Hmm. And the shaking is evidence to the people who are involved in these ceremonies. It's evidence that either a bad spirit is leaving or a good spirit is coming in. Hmm. And one of the reasons they do that, this is what I believe, is because it's to their benefit to know that their ceremony is providing the usefulness that their belief system needs it to have. And since the shaking is out of control of the conscious brain, instead of attributing it to the primitive brain stem, they attribute it to some energetic being outside of themselves doing something to them. Right. See? Well, so it's out of control. Got it. Okay. Okay. Got it. Uh, so 
you'd be hard pressed to find anybody that doesn't have something loop somebody something looping in the nervous system some kind of trauma Did you agree? well it, i believe that every human organism experiences trauma i believe it's the natural state right. of life actually and so we need to take out the negative uh, connotations around the word trauma and recognize, okay, this is part of life. Now, it could be very mild trauma to a very severe trauma, but every human organism, not person, the human organism itself knows that it's living on a planet where we'll, we'll experience something extreme that it will consider a threat and then it will activate its protective mechanisms and this is basically what we call trauma yes yeah, so this is just the missing piece that we have needed so um in that it makes it a pretty exciting time right now doesn't it oh it's very exciting because i think now we're finally moving back to coming out of the head and i think the field of neurology is helping us recognize that but neurology and physiology are intricately connected. You cannot separate the two. We only did it for the sake of studying them, but the human organism never separated it. So they don't know anything about this, see? So we're actually following finally coming back into the body and recognizing even Bessel van der Kolk makes a very clear statement. You cannot heal trauma without the body, yeah. period. It registers trauma and we need it to do that. And that's the place to go to help that registry be sort of undone. Got it, got it. So how did you, just to go uh, back to the original question, um, did you have a trauma to deal with yourself or what, what drove you to go into this field? And well, I was living in the Middle East in war, actually, and some African countries that were experiencing war. And one time I was in a country and we were being bombed, and um, we all ran to a bomb shelter. And what was interesting about it was that in the bomb shelter, I was holding two children, and they were shaking. They were about two years old, and they were shaking out of terror, really. And I could feel the shaking in my hands from their bodies. And when I looked around the room, I realized these young children are shaking. They've got to be more natural. They're not inhibited yet. Right. And when I looked at sort of the teenagers from like 11, 12, and 13, you could see they were shaking a little bit, but they were trying to control it. Finally, the adults weren't shaking at all. And I realized at that moment, I was seeing something extremely primitive and uninhibited in those children that in some way got inhibited as we grew up, mm -hmm. that we could learn how to control it. So when we left the bomb shelter, I asked these adults, I said, do you ever shake? Like the children were shaking. And their answer was very telling and sort of confirming for me. We don't shake because we don't want the children to think we were afraid. So the shaking was associated with fear rather than with health. Mm -hmm. See, otherwise the whole room would have sh tremored or shaken itself knowing they were being healthy because they were doing it. Instead, right. they were inhibiting the mechanism, right. whereas the young children were freely allowing it to express itself because they hadn't learned how to inhibit it. So it was from that experience that I began to unravel this primitive mechanism in the human body that's there to help us reduce stress. Right. Right. So I lived in a lot of countries around the world. Okay, so you experienced a lot. Uh, the Middle East, uh, I have to say, you know, you just watch the news and I, I can't imagine uh, living there and what those people must go through and, and to keep their sanity. So, yeah, well, that was obviously, and this is one of those things you can only say post facto, obviously one of the most transformative experiences of my life. Right. Definitely some of the most difficult experiences as well, because I was living in war and confronting life and death questions and issues as well. Had to go through my own trauma recovery and all the questioning that happens during that. But it's one of those confusing events for me still that so many traumatized people, when they recover from the trauma, they will almost point to that experience as being the most transformative of their life. Right. So what is it that the human organism, the closer it gets to a death experience, the bigger the transformation generally is afterwards, right. if they can resolve the trauma. You know, I was going to save this 
to the end, but you've, you've already opened this up. So uh, Dr. Peter Lean, when I, I saw a video of his, and one of the statements he, he made surprised me. He said that trauma is one of the, uh, the pathways to enlightenment. I just kind of went, what? And as I've done this work that, that we do, it's like, yeah, I completely, uh, I, I'm sure you see that all the time. It's, it's like an awakening to, um, I guess, the life inside of you in, in a sense, or the energy inside of you, I guess. Huh? You know, that takes this whole trauma recovery question to a much deeper issue, which I love. I think it's worth exploring. But, and I hate it. I hate to have to say that it seems like trauma is one of the right. doors into a deeper understanding of myself and therefore deeper expression of my being but it seems to be that way and so then we have to try to make sense of that to help ourselves understand it and that's where the studies in post-traumatic growth come from Um, there's a lot of research now being done on why are people different after traumas and usually better after traumas and why do many people talk about quotes spiritual experiences as a result of either the trauma or the trauma recovery process. So there's something revealing itself to us that this is factual to the human organisms on the planet. This occurs. It occurs in every culture, every language, every religious tradition all over the world. It means the human organism has this ability that somehow it takes these difficult experiences and not only recovers, but in some way somehow expands from those experiences. I don't like that, but it seems to be a fact. It it seems, I've come to the conclusion, realization, that life is always pushing us inside. And the one thing about trauma is it's looping. Mm -hmm. And that looping creates a, a pattern in our life. And until we look at it, inside of us it's going to keep going so it's i kind of i see it as the universe's way of pushing us inside so yeah uh, i think that's a simple way of saying it but i think it's true that energetic field or whatever that is that consciousness loops and loops and loops because it's looking for both integration and then expression right and when it doesn't find it it just keeps moving and moving until we can find the way to give it an internal interpretation, which leads to an external expression of usually a better being. Yeah. But you're right about that, I think. Nice. So you have worked, um, one of the things that I found really intriguing is with different uh, religious groups, which you had to, uh, which is what, what I feel is so great about this because it is completely uh, unbiased international doesn't matter what you think or what you believe but uh, you've had to work with different organizations or different uh, I guess religious groups is the right term mm-hmm. to, uh, and bring how did you say um, uh, 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 bringing the organizations together yeah resolution a conflict yeah. resolution there we go. Yeah, I worked a lot in many countries, and obviously the the faction groups are fighting and stuff, but the easiest one in some ways to work with were Palestinians and Israelis, because I lived in both the Palestinian West Bank, and I had a lot of um, uh, Israelis that I was working with at the time, and so I would move back and forth between those two areas. And I always had left-wing Palestinians and left-wing Israelis, so it wasn't too complicated. They wanted peace. Right. You know, and so I worked with them separately um, because I had attended several nonviolent communication sessions and I realized they were completely useless. And that's not to say nonviolent communication is useless, but it drove people into their heads. Right. And I realized they need to feel what's going on mm-hmm. because they, they could get angry, but then they were given a, a, a way of trying to express that anger. Yeah through ver- through words. And I thought, well, the anger is also physiological. So I started teaching Palestinians and Israelis separately as groups how to do TRE. And I tried to help ingrain in them that all you're doing is experiencing a living pulsating organism. Take away culture, take away language, your religious tradition, take it all away because your organism knows nothing about any of it. And just feel the body as it tremors and then describe the tremor 
according to where it is physiologically in the structure. So you take away, oh, I'm feeling anger in my heart or whatever. No, I just want to know physiologically, is the heart tight? Is, how, do you, how would you know that was anger? What's the physiological expression? So I tried to boil all of us down to that basic um, interactive level. And once the Palestinians and Israelis got it, then I said, let's work together. And of course, they were all excited about it. So we had to do lots of different things to get this to happen. But all I did was pair off one Israeli with one Palestinian. And so I would make the, have the Israeli tremor in TRE while the Palestinian watched. And they would give feedback only on what they were seeing. That's all. Mm -hmm. See, so we kept it at the very basic level of the human organism. And so then after that was done, the Israeli would watch the Palestinian tremor. And they would just observe what's tremoring. And they discovered that if they used that common language of just describing physiology, they got it. Oh, my God, we're all identical. <laughs> he's got trauma from a, a bus bomb and he's got trauma from a shooting. But the organism's holding the trauma the exact same way and it can physiologically get them out and the, it doesn't need the story to do it. Yeah. And that's what sort of broke that ability for them to come together and truly have transformative experiences with each other because there was no, no verbiage to go with it, no articulation. There was nothing in the head at all. It was purely what you see or what you feel in this moment. Right. That's how I did it. Well, magical. Simple, magical. Simple is a good word. We need to become yes, more simple. We like simple. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's I have to say what I love about TRE. It's it is it simplifies things. So that was, that's great. So yes. how do you see this? First of all, affecting people. How does how does it? Just I'm going to do a, a sequence here. How do you see this affecting people, basically? Okay, so the the way TRE works is you can actually teach it to large populations which i do all the time so japan i worked with tsunami survivors we would have like 300 of them in a room take them through the exercises let them all tremor and then have them talk to each other at the end of their experience what was it like and then keep repeating it see and it's the repetition that's most helpful so now you've taken a, a population of people that are living like this in fear every day and you can immediately begin to release that and get them to go back to be relaxed again mm -hmm. and so now our all of our populations particularly in our what we call our western world or developed nations they're all very highly elevated nervous systems very few of us even know a down-regulated nervous system any longer. And so that's what gives rise to the violence and the dysfunction, all the manifestations right. of this that we see. Right. And we have to calm down entire nations of people, see? And so we have to do that. That's not an option anymore. Mm -hmm. So the way I see it affecting people is if we could simply get it out on mass and be teaching it in nonprofit organizations, government organizations, etc., military definitely, and keep reducing the stressors. You can actually have a population that can ground themselves again mm -hmm. and make wiser decisions about all of life. Mm -hmm. Now that's a that seems like a big task, but I believe the human organism, that's quite simple. Um, and so it's just a matter of us respecting of letting our human organisms, in a sense, communicate and teach one another, just like you taught your mother, et cetera. This can be passed around without needing professional direction to do it. It could be entire families that do it together when they're traumatized by a sudden death or whatever it may be, right. or entire communities. Right. And I work a lot with military, right. often can be used with military or policemen, first responders, and they love it because it works for them. Yeah. Yeah. If any, anywhere it's needed, it's in, in those areas, yeah. in ambulance and so on. Huh? And that was kind of my next question. How do you feel that you see this as, uh, as affecting society? And so in making, you know, we consider, or I talk about the inside creating the outside. So when we're at peace within ourselves, we tend to be, uh, creating and being attracting peaceful experiences and loving experiences so it can't help but have a domino effect in the world I would have to think yeah yeah well Thichnot Han was really good in in one of his books where he says basically you know if 
You can't go out and bring peace if you have violence inside of you. You've got to resolve your inner violence. And that's exactly what we see right now, although we've had it you know, through the whole history of humanity. But just taking our present um, state, we see tremendous amounts of increased violence. And people who are claiming to be promoting peace are very angry and violent in, at times in their way of um, trying to promote peace. Right. It's a perfect example that they're violent inside themselves. Their peace efforts will never work. They are doomed to failure, period, mm -hmm. although they don't seem to get it still. <laughs> but you're right. Until, And this is the hard piece. We have to do our own inner work. And it's much easier for me to tell you that you have to change than it is for me to tell me I have to change. And that's where we are in the world. Everyone's telling everybody else, you have to change because I don't like your behavior. Nobody is looking at themselves and say, if I change, maybe other people will change on the planet. Well, I, I might challenge you on that just because of the work that you're bringing forth and some of the stuff that we do. It kind of shows us that we well, are. Well, yeah, you know, hopefully we're living that in our own lives, certainly in our own growth processes, because you're, you're deeply involved in your center for trauma recovery, and I'm involved in trauma recovery. It's like, it's, I try to look at it as this is a growth process. It's going to happen until the day I die. It isn't something that has a goal, and at this point I'll be healed of trauma, or there's an end. That's like saying there's an end to the evolution of my consciousness. No, there's not an end, but trauma may be in that evolution of consciousness, and I have to embrace that as much as I can embrace sitting on a beach and drinking a gin and tonic someday. <laughs> in one sense they're identical they just we attribute different qualities to them i appreciate you you uh said earlier that we need to change our view of trauma and not make it such a bad word because we are going to experience trauma there's just no question about it so yeah. i guess simply admitting that uh right off the get-go and now having the tools to deal with it um, you know, we, we can not. Yeah, I think the more we have tools to deal with it and more natural tools yeah. like what you're doing and what I'm doing, yeah. we begin to see, oh, wait, this is just human evolution. This is the nature of being a living organism on this planet. We're going to experience traumas as much as any plant will or any animal will. So will every human. They'll experience difficulty in life even when they grow up in multi-million dollar protected homes, why would they commit suicide? Why would they go into drugs? It, we can't protect ourselves from our own evolutionary process, which is often what generates the traumatic experience or expression in the first place. Mm -hmm. So it's the nature of our humanness yeah. to yeah. tease and play with what we call trauma. And the funniest thing about this is I get so many invitations from military all over the world, and they call me up to tell me that they loved what I was talking about in terms of trauma, Will you come and present it to our military? But don't use the word trauma when you come here. Oh, is that right? Okay. Yeah, it's a perfect example of that's what they want to need, right. but we have so stigmatized that word that no one wants to admit to it or use it in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. We may need to get an entirely new word, I don't know, or we have to simply normalize this. Right, right. And, you know, like say, it's like the shaking things, if you get associated with trauma, then there's something wrong with you or... Uh, exactly right. It's kind of interesting. The more we go back to the nature of our human organism, the more we kind of feel like something's wrong with us because the human organism does things that our ego doesn't understand. Right. And we're not understanding why this is happening and, right. and what's going on. And so then we go to somebody else to give us direction about simply the nature of, of a pulsating living body. Right, right. So the stuff that we do is very specifically, or you know, we don't have to uh, explain it or even go into it, but it's very left-right brain. We are we right. are allowing that right brain to express because it seems to get locked out in time of trauma. So with the TRE, it, it kind of takes the whole, doesn't it? I mean, it's the same thing. You don't have to think about it; it just occurs. But it's bringing your your nervous system back to the, the state of homeostasis. It's right. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Restores homeostasis. It just does it from, think of it this way, conceptually, it comes from the body, so the tremor mechanism moves up the spine, goes into the most primitive parts of the brain, the brain stem, and then obviously the limbic system where the emotions are, and then spreads out to left and right hemispheres. That's our neurophysiology. We're designed that way. But it's bimodal, so you can use yours from left and right brain uh, activation, and it can go the opposite direction down into the body. Nice. See, so this is what's good about the human organism. It has already built in a bimodal communication right. from top down or bottom up. So we have access to it in both directions. Right, right. Yeah. I've really enjoyed this conversation, and it's great to uh, – I- I've heard things. I watched uh, a bunch of your different videos and, and so on. and uh, It's great to hear – um, you know, another level to this. So I really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, I did too. Thank you. It's very nice. I hope it's helpful for you. Great. And so, first of all, if you have two books, that that uh, your main books are the Revolutionary Trauma Release Process, Transcend Your Toughest Times. Did that in two thousand eight, and you have a new one which is Shake It Off Naturally. Uh, 2015. Um, so, what uh, can you tell us about those books, and what would you suggest? I would always suggest the first one you recommended simply because it's more basic. It's for a general audience. That's who I wrote it for. And there's a video that goes with that book. And it's for people like your listeners who may want to try the exercises at home by themselves, but understand what they're doing. Okay. The one shake it off naturally is a more advanced book. Because as we, I've been teaching TRE around the world, and we have lots of trainers, we've been gathering data and information, trying to be more precise and specific, mostly for the medical community to try to embrace this. Right. So it's a little bit more heady and a little bit more uh, articulate of what's happening neurologically or physiologically. But it's also an edited book. I took people's experiences from around the world and ask them to share those experiences because they're all coming from different cultures. Now, in that sense, it's, it's quite nice, but it's basically storytelling of how people have used TRE around the world and the successes that they have had with it. But if somebody really wants to learn how to TR, do TRE and they want just a simple explanation of it, um, Transcend Your Toughest Time is the book. Okay. And you do have a third one, which is just called TRE, correct? Or trauma release? That's actually the first book. Yeah. Okay. And that's even more basic. That was me just initially articulating all this. Now it's a, it's a number of stories. It's a very easy read. And I made it that way. Each story is only one page long. And as you read the stories, it's sort of like our interview here. I'm unfolding page by page, how I came to TRE and then at the end, I demonstrate how to do the exercises. Got it. Got it. Fantastic. And your website is? Uh, traumaprevention.com. Okay. So they can go there and see all your other products. And- yeah. Yeah. And for certification as well. Great. Yeah. And we'll also have your books on our site, which would be great too. Thank you. So what is your, you've done so many different things and so much. What's your vision? What do you, what's the, does the future hold for you? And what, what's your vision of the future? Well, Right now, where we're at as a global culture, I think um, that we're, we're, we're returning back in some ways to the basics because we realize that going into our head and where that's driven us hasn't been a pleasant place. So you have a lot of people who are saying, I want to go live quietly and I want to get rid of all the chaos in my life. I'm tired of this, I'm tired of that. And even young people are doing this. I want to live a more simple life. I don't want a mortgage. I don't want to be tied down. I think all of that is moving us in the right direction. It's more back to the basics of living in a human body and and enjoying the pleasure of that. And I think we need to start articulating that more clearly from that perspective rather than from the head perspective because that's basically what they're pushing away. And they're saying, what I really want is about feeling a life of pleasure, feeling the comfort of everyday life, just walking in a field or eating fresh fruits and vegetables, etc. I think we're going to be moving back to that era where people lived a more simple lifestyle. And we can help promote that and give them some healthy skills 
where they don't get stuck um, from traumas that they will still have during those times and mostly self-help skills. So that's the direction I'm moving in, is trying to figure out how to articulate it even more simply without great neurological or physiological explanations and how to help support our culture to move back to a place where it's my body, I have a right to know how it works, I have a right to know how to help my body work, and TRE is one of those um, mechanisms that I want to try to give to people. Nice, absolutely. And thank you so much for TRE and for the great gift it is. It's, it's uh, genius because it's simple and uh, profound. So Yeah, uh, so well, that's our human body, simple but <laughs> profound. So let's stick with that. <laughs> absolutely. All right. Thank you again, David. Been a pleasure speaking with you. And uh, I look forward to uh, connecting with you more throughout the... Uh, the yeah, yeah, please feel free to connect with me. I enjoyed our conversation. It'll be fun. I did as well. All right. So thank you all for listening. Uh, once again, Dr. David Bercelli for, with TRE, the Trauma Release Exercises. Uh, you can pick up his books and go to his website and find out more and see more of uh, his products and services. And uh, hope you enjoyed this, this interview. I know I did. So thank you again. Thanks a lot. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye.